Welcome back to another episode of The Debrief. Uh, I don't even know what to say anymore. It's the third Alpine World Cup of the year. We got one more to go before we take a break for the Olympics. Uh, we've got only a few more days before Brienne Son, so we got to cram this episode in here. We got our emergency guest deployed from the other side of the planet, Eddie Falk, who, as John and I, or as I specifically discovered, does not live 18 hours ahead of us. He lives 16 hours ahead of us. Eddie is only now learning that John and I started this episode two hours ago and realized we did the math wrong while he was still asleep. But anyway, Eddie, it's great to have you back. Thanks so much for, for taking the time, as always. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, of course, John Bergman, uh, the, the typical co-host or usual co-host, sorry, uh, joining from uh, from Indiana in the same time zone as me, way easier than uh, than otherwise. How are you doing, John? Doing well. Had to un unmute my uh, microphone there. Yeah, all's well here. Excited to, excited to talk. Feels like uh, we just did one of these, which is because we did. Yeah, and we're yeah. going to do another one like tomorrow or whenever yeah. Brienne Son is over. So we're just cranking yeah. these things out. By the way, do you, have a, do you have a set decorator? I feel like every episode, the picture behind you changes. Are you actually... I'm I, they're in rotation, right? This is, uh, <laughs> for, for people, this is um, Brooke congratulating Natalia when uh, Natalia won at Salt Lake City number one, I believe, um, just a few weeks ago. It was really cool, awesome moment. Brooke ran out to congratulate her. Of course, they're, you know, great friends and stuff. So yeah, I rotate, you know, got to it's, keep it's it. always thematically like on point. You've always, uh, you've always got it set up. No, that's wicked. Um, we're, we're not going to bother too much with introductions. If you haven't watched Eddie's uh, first visit from this season or the one from last season, or I think, I think we did an interview years before as well. Years There's ago, yep. plenty of Eddie content to check out. Uh, but we're just going to dive right into uh, the show because there's lots to talk about from uh, from it's been our first like single discipline World Cup in, in quite a few months. And I was kind of worried we'd be light on content, but I don't think so. So uh, we'll bang into headlines. And I'm, I'm not sure if we need to go too deep into this now because I imagine it'll come up in other discussions. But my headline for this event is the athletes would like to speak to your manager. Um, felt like social media from the athletes there's always you know the typical fluff the great photos from from people that are at the venue and of course sharing shots with their wins and uh and and them on the climb but there was also a lot of complaints whether it was about the route setting uh from yanya and uh then i, I noticed sean mccall also doubled down on that appeals from yannick flowey and then his german compatriots uh piling on as well and then of course earlier in the week some issues about how seriously the ifsc is taking their broadcasting standards when it comes to how athletes are portrayed after the johanna farber incident at innsbruck um so it felt like one of those those events where we were just talking about the meta stuff the organizational stuff um, rather than the climbing uh, in a lot of ways. And of course, there's more topics outside of the climbing that we're going to discuss. So that's kind of my headline. Um, I don't know if you guys want to jump right in or if you guys want to share your headlines first, and then we can kind of go from there. Um, but uh, but John, I'm curious what, what your headline for the week is. Oh, wow. Uh, there's a lot to unpack in your, from your headline as well. Well, we'll um, throw them all out there and then we'll see where we go. Okay. My headline is t totally different. Totally different. Um, you know, last week I was talking a lot. Of, of course, my big headline had to do with Sean Bailey and whatnot. So I wanted to do a headline this week that was talking about the women's division, since last week my headline predominantly had to do with the, the men's division. And with these headlines, I always try to think of, like, what is the larger takeaway or what did we learn beyond just the event itself? In other words, like, how does this paint a picture for – something greater, whether it's the overall season or in the case of like a, a rivalry or in the case of Sean Bailey, it was kind of his place in the American, you know, kind of historic landscape. So my headline for this event is I actually think we are very unanchored in the women's lead division in terms of a single storyline. I, I don't, I, it's really <laughs> phenomenal because we have not Would you really... say unhinged by any chance? Not unhinged, no. No, because here's the thing: it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's kind of cool, but we have not. We're we're like not used to being in this position, right? Because I was thinking back to previous years. Uh, uh, you know, first of all, like we're so used to Yanya Yanya's dominance being the the big storyline in the women's lead division. Well, that's out of the window this year. Um, 
another big headline, I think, in years past, and also what we were expecting maybe this year, of course, COVID messed everything up, but I think we were expecting maybe to continue that Cheyenne Yanya rivalry, right? That little storyline to continue that. Or well, Cheyenne hasn't least, been at these. Yeah. Yeah, so Cheyenne hasn't been at these comps, so that's that's out of the the that's out of the the cards. You kind of have some young phenoms coming onto the scene, um, which is great to see. I don't know if any of them have quite um, f- become like headline worthy, although they've been really fun to watch. But but they're not really there yet, so that so that's not a storyline. Um, and then even with Laura Regora, she has had. a a great start to the season so far, but she's also had, you know, a little bit of inconsistency and the lead season is also early. So I think it's, it's, we're not to the point where we can like start, you know, saying all these sort of platitudes about Laura Regora's season being wonderful and stuff. Maybe it will be, but it's too early to tell. So I don't know if that is the the headline. So that just reiterates my point. It's like, we, I don't know what the big storyline is in the women's lead division right now. I guess I would pose that question to you after all that preamble by me is what is the big narrative in the women's lead division? That's a, that's a great question. I want to hear Eddie's headline and then let's just circle through these for a little bit before we get to winners and losers. Um, I, I kind of want to talk about John's because okay. I love the fact that you were like, Yanya's sort of no longer in the picture. I'm like, yeah, she only did two lead world cups and won both of them. <laughs> <laughs> that That's kind of picturesque to me. Yeah, <laughs> two, out, uh, yeah. two out of three. Come on. Give I, the girl I, a break. I, I don't want to maybe I don't remember how I phrase it. I don't mean to think that Yanya's like, yeah, she, certainly she is still a, her, worthy of the headline. But my point was she, you know, she was gone for this event. She's going to be gone from Brianson. So for the time being, she's not the headline of the women's lead division. Um, yeah. 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 Your point's well I, taken. I, I think for a little while, none of the Olympians are that headline. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, obviously, at least for Brian Son. I don't think any Olympians are in Brian Son, are they? Uh, Alberto was on the registration list the last time I checked. So Yeah, so... Not a lot. We will see. <laughs> um, look, I don't really have a solid headline as such. I kind of had two candidates. Um, so my first candidate was Let There Be Bolts or at least the standing on of bolts. <laughs> um, my second candidate was um, transparent or not, because I think there's, from what we're seeing from the athletes, there's lots of questions about the transparency of the way events are being run and decisions are being made at the moment. Sure. Okay, let's uh, let's talk about John's first, and then we'll we'll kind of because I think some of those issues, uh, Eddie, uh, yours and mine, are a little bit combined, and uh, we might save them for the for the loser bracket. But yeah, uh, talking about the women's the women's narrative for this year, I think is interesting. But I think one one good point that was brought up, and it might have been you, Eddie, is that there's a lot of uncertainty around how the rest of the season goes. Right, like Brienne's on is going to happen. It's going to be a weird field. I, I'm not sure, but I don't think there are going to be any female Olympians there. Um, so that's basically a hundred ranking points up in the air for the season rankings. And then after that, we, we've got, uh, Kron now on the calendar rather than, uh, I'm going to butch, I don't know how to pronounce L and J back to back twice. Ljubljana. Ljubljana. Okay. <laughs> so the Slovenian stop has gone back to its, uh, its proper home in Kron. Um, but after that, then you've got two, uh, or the last lead world cup, sorry, uh, in China, which may not happen. We still don't know how travel is going to, is going to work out in Asia for those last three two, three World Cups out there. Um, so I, I think that like the season may be stunted on on the back end, but also these middle ones are a little bit weird because of the Olympic um, absences. But at the moment, yeah, it's it's Yanya and Lara, I think, are the is the story um, for the for the women's side. It's unwritten at the moment because Brianne Son won't really affect that storyline. Uh, the only thing that you have to think about is could somebody like a Natalia Grossman who has meddled at every single world cup this season so far <laughs> whatever city she goes to she just asks for a medal please and they give one to her you know she now has that room if she goes to Brianson, if she goes to slovenia you know she could end up having a, a, a better uh, a better ranking score for the season than all of them so i think yanya and laura are are the the kind of the top tier right now but there is so much space for somebody to come up behind them uh, depending on how the olympians go so those are my two for for the storyline 
Yeah, I mean, that's pretty pretty on point. I actually really think Natalia is the big storyline. Um, I think there's a realistic chance that she could be the bolder overall champion and the lead overall champion this year. Um, Certainly possible, as we, yeah. As we briefly discussed with the Asian comps, we haven't heard anything about them. But at this stage, there's no international events being held in Korea. Uh, there's no international events being held in China. So that would have to change for those World Cups to go ahead. Um, so that means, okay, Boulder season's closed. And Boulder season closed, well, that means Natalia's won. Yep. Now, that I'm not saying she has because there's still time for possibly other events to come on board to fill the Asian slots or it's still time for regulations to relax and those Asian comps to happen. But we can say that's a possibility, not a probability at the moment. So I think you've got Natalia sitting in a very strong position there. Then if you look at lead, your top four athletes, uh, Laura, Yanya, Vita and Natalia. Vita and Natalia uh, almost neck and neck. You know, 153 points plays 151 points in the overall. Now, Brion Son, it becomes a shootout between Vita and Natalia effectively, in terms of points for the overall. Mm -hmm. um, with the only other real spoiler that can get in there is Alexandra Totkova from sure. Bulgaria, which is also a huge storyline. Now, to me, not having the Olympians and Brian Son kind of makes it real fun because, yeah, we, we, we get to see this, the other guys. It's kind of like, you know, that movie with Barack and whoever it was where they were like, they had the cops that were kind of the ones that weren't the, the top flight ones. That had I, feel, to take... I feel like I can picture the, 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 the poster for it, but I don't, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Just like a buddy comedy kind of thing. <laughs> it, it's exactly a buddy yeah. comedy, and it's like the main cops are suddenly not there, so the other guys have to right. come up and shine. And I, I just, I think this is the chance for, yeah, Natalia, Vita, um, Alexandra, people like that who aren't on the Olympic list. Because if you look at the current rankings and lead, it gets pretty skinny if you take out those Olympians. It's a chance for them to come up. And, you know, again, Kran... Is Kran supposed to be the last World Cup? I'm trying to remember if it was going to be an Asian lead. Uh, no, um, one of the... Uh, no, so Brian Son is the fourth. Kran would be the fifth. And then which stop is it? I've got it right here. Uh, Shia Man was supposed to have the last one in uh, yeah. uh, mid-october yep so if you've got no shim and then you've got five comps so you've got no drop score and you've got at least two comps of the olympian or one comp i should say if the olympian's not there yeah. but for a lot of the olympians like yanya yeah. etc two comps so i think yeah this like totally could be natalia's year um i think it already is natalia's year sure. if i was her manager i'd be knocking on sponsors doors asking for lots of pay rises no kidding no kidding yeah i, I wanted to throw out there uh, to, to counter uh that discussion like because um on the men's side i feel like it's kind of equally unwritten i know i know we've talked a lot about sean bailey because he's had this great back-to-back -back and he's a climber that we've spoken about before and he's kind of breaking through his own narrative at least in my head like he's kind of he's kind of proving to me that i i can expect more from him but it's it's equally close it's like sean bailey with with 200 points and stefano gizolfi like right behind him and then another tight bunch of guys and I don't think any of them are Olympians. No, the top four aren't Olympians. And after that, it's Magos and Jiménez Lopez and stuff. Um, so that's that's another spot where that that door is wide open. So I think I think it's really interesting in lead. And like normally, I try not to like think too much about the rankings until after yeah. the fourth event because that's really the only time where you feel like you can actually start making calculations on who's still in and who's out. But at the moment, at least, it looks pretty pretty tight. And I think Brian Son will end up being like a, a really impactful comp for for all of those climbers. So we'll have to see what happens. But um, yeah, I, I think the difference is we. We, we kind of expected the men's to be that way, or at least it it's, has seemed that way for the last couple of seasons in terms of it's kind of a little more wide open. The, the, the thing that's really surprising to me is to have it in the women's lead division now as well. L like we said, Eddie, largely because Yanya's going, you know, to withdrawing to do the Olympics from these, these next two or whatever. Yeah, that's a very um, fair point. 
But it's great because I feel like this discussion has just kind of reiterated my point. It's like, well, is Nat is Natalia going to do it? Is it going to be Vita's year? Is it going to be um, is Tat Tatkova going to surprise everybody? Like, there's all these there, there's all these like intriguing little maybes um, that that just makes it really hard to pin down like what is the big story, and that's awesome. I mean, it's the flip side of what we had in 2019 uh, or 2018, I guess, and 19 like with Yanya being like the big you know, sort of like the story and all the, the lead events and, and bouldering as well. That's a great story in its own right, of course, obviously, right? It's like the story of the greatest of all time. That's phenomenal. But this is also equally intriguing uh, going into these events like Brian Son, where you're kind of like, yeah, I don't know. It could be anybody's moment. And I'll, I'll be honest, the one thing I'm happy about is that we're able to still be excited about this because coming into the season, that was one of the big questions was like, are the World Cups just going to be garbage knowing that the top tier aren't there? Like, are we going to notice it? Is it going to feel a little bit empty? And it doesn't yet. Um, the, the finals have still been relatively good. We've still had enough top tier athletes or at least enough like colorful athletes. Um, largely thanks to Team USA, frankly, um, that's that have made it like really compelling still. So, yeah, I think it's been uh, on that end, it's been great. To, to that point, Tyler, it's interesting you mentioned that because I can't help but wonder what it would be like, what it will be like in 2024 with in Paris, because here in 2020, 2021, the Olympics, it's only taken 20 men and 20 women. So there's still plenty of people that are, of course, like top level, elite level that are not qualified for the Olympics in Paris. It's going to be what, like 40 men and 40 women. Is that, is, is something like that? Nope. Or... nope. It's going to be 18 men and 18 women. So there for, are for 30, lead and bouldering. So... And then for speed as well, the, the speed as a separate speed, pool. Yeah. Speed, there is speed. Well, they haven't given us the exact figures, but they have said that there's an allocation of 34 men, 34 women to split between the two medals at the Olympics. So we okay. would believe that means 16 for speed because that's a final bracket yeah. and then 18 for lead, which is a weird number, yeah. but such so a it, it is, yeah, yeah, there's still so speculation. It's more, though. Yeah. The point is it's more than now. So you're, so we are, theoretically, we might see more competitors dropping off of the circuit to focus on the Olympics in 2024. Um, you know, maybe. We, it, mm -hmm. It's just interesting to think about because I think, as much as it's it's too bad that we only get 20 men and 20 women for this Tokyo Olympics, you know, I, I, the whole refrain has always been, oh, I wish we could send more, right? Of course, you wish that, like, Sean Bailey could go as well and all these others. But, like, the trade-off is, well, we it's such a, it's a small field that's going to the Olympics. The po On the positive note, we get a lot of people that are staying on the World Cup circuit, you know, top-level people, because they're not, they're not going to the Olympics. I actually think it's speed that's going to be decimated in 2024. Because if you take the 16 top speed climbers out for Olympics, um, depending on when the comps are held, you know, that that's all of the finals bracket. It's gone. Pretty sick European, European, Asian. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, I wanted to one counter that with one point is like, isn't one of the reasons that the Olympics is, is causing so much trouble, partly because everybody's been having to train so many different disciplines that they've had a lot of like a really hard time scheduling their training to be prepared for the Olympics. Like I, I feel like if you're just like, okay, I just have to be a lead and bolder, not specialist, but you know, I just get to do what I was doing in the past. I get to do what I'm good at. Don't you have more leeway in your calendar to hit more of the world cups and not worry about, well, no, I'm in like my power phase for speed. And then I got to like train this really quick at the end. Like I feel like, them uh, specifying again is going to make it much easier for people to have a more consistent and predictable and like tr uh, a schedule that they trust and they feel like they can fit it into the World Cup schedule better. I think that's probably the thing that's causing all the mayhem is just the, hey, we've never trained for this before and it's the biggest event of our life. So it's like the ultimate unknown and the ultimate um, goal reward kind of thing. So I, I don't, I feel like it won't be that bad. Maybe if they put a world cup like right two weeks before the olympics yeah that world cup will be completely rogered but the ones before that hopefully shouldn't be affected too much but yeah. um but yeah That's anyway let's let's bring it back to uh to 2021 um yeah the other you know let's let's talk a little about about how the athletes have been have been discussing some some issues particularly over the last week um uh, well, the first thing was we had, um, I can't remember the tag or the name of the Latvian climber. I don't know if anybody has that off the top of their head. Uh, Elise. Elise. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, issuing, uh, a comment on, um, how she perceived the IFSC wasn't, uh, at least 
showing their work when it comes to how they're going to address issues of I don't even know really how to put it, but basically coming off the back of Joanna Farber being intentionally or not uh, overly sexualized um, in the, the broadcast from Innsbruck, um, objectified, I guess might be a better word. So I'm not sure either one uh, and feeling like, yeah, there was there was an uproar. There was an apology from uh, the ORF. Uh, and of course, um, the, the clip was edited out. But I think the athletes, uh, my interpretation of it is, hey, IFSC, you guys are supposed to represent us athletes on a world stage. You're supposed to be protecting us from this kind of behavior. So when something like this happens, you know, we want you to, you know, not just uh, share apologies and fix it and post. We want you to say, like, this is what we're doing to protect you from this ever happening again, because this is a huge problem for us. Um, like, we need you to really be at bat for us and not just not just, you know, fix the fix the replay and then move on to the next thing. Um, so that was the first part. But then within this event, uh, you know, athletes complaining about appeals. Interestingly, two of those appeals involved Italian athletes. Um, unfortunately, I don't know the guy, but the technical delegate happened to be Italian for this event. So I feel like I'm like building a conspiracy here. Um, I have no no information and I'm absolutely not suggesting that. But um, you know, there's concerns about, you know, the uh, legitimacy of the calls made on uh, Yannick Floey getting his plus removed um, to advance Marcello Bombardi into the finals. And then also uh, Laura Regora, who, in my opinion, stepped on a bolt uh, and um, probably should have been scored down, in my opinion, um, which was appealed, but the appeal was denied. Um, so do you guys want to jump off on any of that, Eddie? I feel like you were going to bring it up. So uh, let's roll with it. Look, I First thing I'm going to actually start up on is um, the the one that you raised about the Johanna Faber issue. And I'm going to ask, did we ever see an apology from the IFSC about that? I didn't. They shared the ORF one uh, on social media, from what I understand. I also heard that they then deleted it. Um, mm -hmm. I'll be honest, off the top, that didn't bother me because in my interpretation was it was an error made by the ORF. Um, but this is where kind of the discussion is, is what are the next steps after that, you know? Yeah, see, that perplexes me because I was watching the live stream at the time. And when that happened, there was an absolute blow up on the live chat of people saying, that's not okay, that's unacceptable, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that chat was moderated. So someone from the IFSC was seeing what happened there because they kept deleting all comments about another athlete's weight, but no comments about the um, inappropriate filming were mentioned. And then at the end of the sequence, uh, apparently I switched it off, but from reading um, Behind the Games, which is an outside of climbing Olympic coverage website, they said that that same shot was then used in the highlights wrap up at the end of that segment before they cut the stream. Okay, uh, I'm not now, sure, but... Yes, it's with ORF. That is their dominion. They are the ones managing the stream in terms of the cameras, the production, the direction. But surely if something happens, the IFSC has a channel that they can go to the ORF and say, hey, no, not okay, stop this. And I would have expected an apology from the IFSC as well, saying, you know, we're really sorry we didn't catch this in time. We have now removed it to fix it. Here's the apology from them. And we are looking at strategies internally to make sure that this is not able to happen in our sport again. Instead, it was just past the parcel from what I saw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. um, I'll let you finish. So, you know, it's, yeah, so for me, that's, that's why this later post that came out on social media last week came out wasn't because of the apology from ORF. It was from the lack of interest and the lack of um, engagement from the IFSC. And you have to remember the IFSC has a huge history of this. If something happens that they think casts the sport in a bad light, they will sweep it under the rug rather than address it. You know, in Myringen, when there was the red cards from all the athletes saying the IFSC wasn't doing good enough, here's the red cards, you know, 200 people on stage showing a red card saying this conduct is unacceptable. 
when that got raised in a podcast last year uh, by Charlie Bosco, the IFSC said, take that down. We don't want that showing. And I'm like, that's part of the history of the sport. And that history is recognizing that a mistake was made. You, you've got to be transparent. If you make a mistake, you own it. You show what you did to move on from it. But you don't whitewash that, you know, you don't whitewash your mistakes. And, and that, that so red card incident it, was was regarding their streaming deal at the time with Flow Sports to put the stream behind a pay gate, if I remember that right. Exactly, at incredibly short term notice. Yeah, like a week out, if less uh, than like, that, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Announced on the Thursday, comp started on the Saturday. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, incredibly controversial at the time, but this is what I'm saying. It's just another example of when these things happen. Obviously, they're not good. But instead of just pushing it under the rug and pretending that you're holier than now, you own it. You say, look, this happened. We're really sorry. We learned from it. This is what we're doing now. And if they did the same thing with this ORF situation, look, this happened. We're really apologetic. We've let our moderators know that they need to watch for us from now on. We've let the local production teams know in countries where we're going that we need a direct line to them. And if something is unacceptable, we will be on to them immediately. Then we read that and we go, cool, I'm making steps. They're doing something proactive. Um, and that's what we didn't see. So, yeah, there's a, yeah, just a lack of transparency in what's going on. I, I, I was hesitant to criticize the, the the chain of communication that you're kind of talking about, where if they had a moderator, that person should have, A, seen the stream and seen the chat and been able to report that kind of up the ladder to deal with it before it was included in a replay package. I mean, I don't know if the moderator, even as the video up, you can be moderating this, the, the chat from, from just the window with only the chat, right? So I was a little bit, I don't know where in that chain things may have broken down. It may have broken down in multiple spots because I... I honestly don't know what everybody is doing during a comp. I imagine I imagine the head of media isn't watching the stream. You know, I imagine he's probably doing other things. I don't know for sure. Um, so I, I have a little bit of trouble criticizing that without knowing. But I, I do agree that it is something where I, I, I just don't understand why, you know, it's it, it's it it is barely an issue if you just confront confront the issue when it happens. Right. Like the athletes aren't trying to, you know, hoist anybody on a petard. Right. They're they're they're. They just want these problems to go away. If they happen once, they don't want it to happen again. And so if you can acknowledge, hey, that was garbage. You know, we apologize for whatever part we played in it. And this is how we're going to fix it. I think that's great. The one thing I was kind of concerned about was, does the responsibility for how to fix that end up getting put on the athletes commission? Or does the responsibility for the athletes to communicate that get put on the athletes commission? Because this is the worst possible time for the Athletes Commission, specifically the many of them, including the two presidents of it who are Olympians, like this is not the time for for them to to deal with stuff like this. They don't have the time, although I, Shauna posted that she was on a call with Sean McCall just earlier today, which I just assume is kind of uh, for that business. Um, Sean and Shauna being the two co-preses of the commission at at this point, from what I understand. it's just, it's kind of a, it feels like everybody's just busy with other stuff and they just wish this didn't happen right now. Not only does it make them look bad, but we just feel like we don't have the time, the resources to, to even think about this stuff. And uh, it's just one of those things where it's like, all it all happened at the worst possible time and uh, it just didn't get handled as well as it should have. So it was a shame. To, to that point, Eddie, can you give any insight into how the relationship and the dynamic works between the athlete representatives, um, the president, Sean McCall, and, and, and Sean in this case, or maybe, you know, representatives uh, previously, and, and the, you know, the organization? Like, what is – because this seems like the type of thing where it would be a, a good opportunity, and maybe, Tyler, to your point, maybe that's what's happening right now. It would be a good opportunity for those athlete representatives to sort of be liaisons right to a lot of the 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 chatter and the and the the kind of vocalization that the athletes are saying about this and the organization like somebody that, that can sort of funnel all that into uh positive discourse and and ultimately like some sort of solutions and stuff it seems like that would be like tailor-made for like the role of the athlete representative that's like why you would have a role like that um but I don't know. I don't know how that relationship works. I'd be curious to to hear. Uh, look, I know very little of it, to be honest. I've had 
conversations with Sean, etc., when he's come to me and said, look, you know, from now on there is no photography in isolation because the Athletes Commission has decided that blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, cool, that's fine. You know, as soon as they make a call, you go, that's fine. But I don't understand, or sorry, I'm not across the knowledge of how often they meet, what they discuss, who they liaise with within the IFSC. Um, but I think this whole thing has been really interesting to me um, on a number of levels. And I think the question has to be asked because exactly as you guys said, that the athletes are so busy. They are so busy, so committed, or they are so not there. Um, That's a great point. So Sean, got- Sean McCall, of course, hasn't been on the circuit at all. He's not there to talk to the athletes. And Sean Acoxie has also missed most of the circuit this year. Exactly. I think in Innsbruck, where this happened, there was Kokoro Fuji was there. Um, problem is English isn't his strong suit, so he's very good for the Japanese athletes as their liaison. But, uh, you know, who else was there? Jörg Verhoeven, is he still on the Athletes Commission? I'm not sure. I, 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 um, he used to be the vice chair, but I, I don't think he's still on it. I might be wrong. Yeah. I mean, I haven't looked at the current list, but effectively... I know he used to be on, and if he was, he shouldn't be because now he's involved in route setting, and I don't think you should wear two hats. He's not on it, apparently, uh, no. Okay. Is Charlotte uh, Dreef on it anymore? Or? Charlotte is still on it as appointed by the IFSC president, so she wasn't elected. Um, but some names who So are, she's I, probably the liaison. She's probably the liaison between them and the IFSC, I'd imagine. To the executive committee? Yeah, probably. Yeah. 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 Um, um, yeah, go Who ahead. else is on there? Uh, oh, so ja- Jakob Schubert, for one, uh, Kyra Condi. So there's two athletes that were both in Innsbruck, for example. Um, yeah. Uh, who, well, a bunch of speed athletes who wouldn't have been in Innsbruck specifically. Uh, was Gregor Vazanic there? I think he was. Uh, and then, yeah, Kokoro. Uh, and that's it for speed and or lead and boulder athletes, pardon me. Yeah. It, it so, seems but- like a... a- uh, sorry, it, it seems like an odd crux, doesn't it? Where you you want people like you want the athletes to be there. Like we were just saying, well, it's problem. It's it's potentially problematic if somebody, for example, like Sean McCall is a, a representative or a president, and he's not present at the event. But then the flip side of that is, if Sean McCall is present at the event, he's probably going to be busy do. thinking about trying to make finals, right? So this is this is like the last thing that he would want to have to sort of revert you know convert um revert his energy to so that so that really puts that's really makes this athlete position a a real serious um kind of a tricky spot in terms of who is the ideal candidate or type of you know the the ideal person whether it's somebody that's still on the circuit or retired well if they're retired then they're not presumably like as connected to everybody on the circuit (laughs) Also, um, if you're must... retired as a as a climber and you're still in climbing, you might be in a role that conflicts with the the athlete role. Unfortunately, whether that's as like a, a coach or a root setter or whatnot, so you kind of yeah, you know, and, it... and it, yeah, and if you're retired, well, then you're t- by definition of the role, you're not an active athlete anymore, right? So like you shouldn't be there. So it, this is it gets really complicated when you start thinking about this representative role for that for an athlete. I just think that's a struggle when you deal with athlete representation in general is, is like, you know, if you want, if you, if you wanted to effectively work as like a, a union of like, I guess the, the equivalent would be like a player's union, right? Uh, whether it's like NFL or this or that, um, Part of that is you want to have people that that's their job, right? To act as your advocate. That's that's what they're paid to do. That's what their time is spent doing, not competing and then trying to send off emails after the comp, but before the after party, right? Um, and the issue with that is how do you pay for it? Like, is the IFSC going to pay for it? Because if they do, then that person's beholden to the IFSC. So are the athletes going to pay for it? Well, you know, how much money are they actually making and what athletes pay for it? Like, you know. Do you pay for a rep if you're at your first World Cup? Do you pay for it after your 10th World Cup? Do you pay for it if you like rank top 10? Like there is a lot of questions and also just not a lot of money for for something like that. But it's going to be an issue that they constantly have to deal with until you have somebody whose job it is to do that. Is Stan one of the Yeah, he's still athlete. one of the, Yeah, Stan Kokorin. Stan yeah. Kokorin. I think you guys should do a special episode and get Stan in as a guest and discuss Done. it with him. He's got a great YouTube channel. <laughs> oh, and he's articulate fun intelligent like 
yeah, cut to the chase rather than us discussing it on speculation and, you know, an outsider's perspective. Let's bring in Stan. Done. I'll reach out and we'll see what's up. And Tyler, to something that you said at the very beginning, the, the unfortunate takeaway of all this is, you know, the headline or your headline has nothing to do with the competition itself, right? Mm-hmm. And that's never a position that anybody wants to be in, where the big story coming away from it isn't about the the event, the action at the event. It's about some ancillary aspect. Uh, sure. That's, you know, that's too bad, but it's the reality. It, of course, it's mostly a headline for people that, like, you know, wake up way too early for these comps, talk about the comps during the comps, and then a couple of days later record a show talking about the comps, right? It's the headline for, for people that are maybe a bit too deep into it. I'm sure most watchers didn't notice or hear any of this stuff, or they think, you know, some of the Instagram posts are just funny gossip or whatever. So I don't think it ultimately affects the the halo of the sport or anything. Um, but, uh, but who knows the the one here's, here's the, just, just to kind of wrap up this and then we can talk about winners. So Yanya made a post about the, the way I interpreted it was about the nine way tie in semifinals for the women. Um, and, uh, she kind of like added the IFSC, not really suggesting what she was talking about or who she was complaining to. And then Sean McCall re re regrammed retweeted the same thing and i it just made me laugh because it's so funny to me that we're so we, we really back off criticizing root setters that's like a thing where the second you criticize a root setter then somebody's there right away with the list of all of the things that you know make root setting a hard job and why they deserve not to be criticized and this was kind of one of those examples where obviously the criticism is of the root setting and instead of saying you know damn, this is crap root setting. It's like at IFSC, just to the generic body who obviously it's it's in their interest to, to worry about these things. But we just kind of like, we kind of just like swerved around who we were actually criticizing. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. Like if the root settings doesn't do its job, which in that round in particular, you could argue that it didn't. Why not just say, hey, this was a shit round, root setters. Like fix it for next round. And they did for the women. At least. Well, well, you wouldn't want you wouldn't. I, I I don't think you would want somebody calling out the root setters, like Instagram, or maybe you would, right? Like so in that post, <laughs> if somebody's yeah, like, sure. yeah, these routes were were terrible, you know, at whoever, you know, right. whoever the route setter was, like that that would seem a little petty, right? Or maybe not. I I don't know. Is that what you would you think that that would be better than calling out the IFSC? No, I probably don't. I feel like social media is like probably not the the. Yeah like for for for, 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 yeah the internet's just a terrible place to start launching all of Yanya Garnbrett's fans against some helpless you know I don't know Austrian Polish root setter I've no I can't remember who is setting for this weekend um but I I guess what what I'm it, it you know I think there's a lot of you know valid criticism that should be directed at the IFSE for specific things and I just feel like this is one of the ones where you know the IFSE I think has a lot of framework and and things in place to kind of suggest what we value in root setting what we think is important what what a good set of results are and then ultimately it's on the root setters to not just understand that but then to execute it um and so like what what's the IFSC supposed to do after seeing that semifinals be like hey guys did you forget that we prefer we don't have a nine-way tie in semifinals and the root setters are like oh we forgot like I don't know what's what are they supposed to do like read it's like you know you've got some employee that just constantly like I don't know like is is like talking on their phone during work like they know that's not what you're supposed to do you're gonna like read them the staff manual again I feel or like I don't know I feel like that's just like that's not going to be effective anyway it's it's tricky because I think sometimes when we have things like this and I always feel it happens when I'm on the show so I don't want to be the catalyst for it but we seem to be like IFSC knocking and you know obviously I have beef with certain elements of the IFSC but on the whole a lot of the IFSC people do a fantastic job and within the sporting department etc work incredibly hard for innovation and development in the sport however when you're discussing something you're going to go into the negatives occasionally and it's, it's not that we hate them it's that they are a focal point of the discussion. And I get the feeling with Yanya's post is because sometimes root setters get pressured to get the results that the organizers want because they feel it's what the crowds want. And it's been well known for a long time that French like tops. 
<laughs> and you know the root setters then get pressured that oh we want you know at least a couple of tops this round just to keep the crowd enthusiastic and the problem is how do you measure the line between two tops five tops no you know it, it's such a i think it's easier to set a little bit too hard and knock them off on the head wall than it is to set a little set just right you end up setting too easy mm -hmm. um so yanya's response to me is in relation to several we had several discussions in 2019 about this and she just felt on the whole that the root setting was not being pushed to be hardest enough by the ifsc because the ifsc was wanting those great shots of someone hanging the top jug going yay look at me i'm at the top yanya's like a you know I, I want to see the best climbers in the world fighting on the hardest climbs falling off at their limit sure um because she you know if you were as good as yanya the biggest risk to yanya is never that a route is too hard the biggest risk is that the route is too easy yeah and interestingly, I felt like this was the first World Cup or lead World Cup so far where the route setting wasn't actually that fun to watch, which is really unfortunate. I felt like the first two were bangers. I, I enjoyed the finals, if I remember right. I've probably blurred all the rounds into, into one. But I feel like the last two shows we've talked about how like, hey, I'm happy with how these routes looked. I'm happy with how they felt. And I felt like the climbing was good on them overall as an impression. Like this is the first time where it feels like the route setting missed the mark enough where I'm, where I'm kind of like bummed about it. Yeah. See, that's interesting. Cause for me, and I know some people would totally disagree with me here, but I really enjoyed men's final mm -hmm. because they switched on hard and they were fighting. They weren't pumping out and getting bored or like, you know, hanging off a clip while they ate a subway, they were fighting to the death. And that's fantastic. And I thought men's final was good. I thought women's final was reasonable. Men's semi didn't seem very interesting, it seemed to be power resistance to a boulder problem, um, which unfortunately a lot of these guys can unlock. Or if they can't unlock, they all fell off around the same place. Um, so you ended up with quite bo quite a bottleneck section within about a four hold spread. Yeah. Um, and then the woman's route, they forgot to put the crux on altogether. Um, so, you know, woman's route for me was, it's interesting. I've spoken to a lot of route setters over the years and they have just said for woman now, you cannot set heel hooks, right? You cannot put the big rail holds in. Because they get their hands on it, they move to the next handhold, they put their heel on it, they, they recover yeah. everything. So to set, and if you go back and look at Innsbruck, etc. And okay, there are heel hooks, but they're insecure heel hooks, dicey heel hooks where they can't get much back. As soon as you have any sort of rail, and there was a lot of those in girls semis, that they're going to camp and they're going to recover so well. Right. Um, they're, they're just unfortunately too good at that style of climbing. Interesting. How do you guys yeah, feel it, about? It, oh, go ahead, John. I was just going to say it's interesting that we can kind of be critical on on the route setting a little bit. Although I did, I kind of agree with Eddie. I really liked the men's final. Um, it sounded like Sean Bailey, who won, really liked it too. He had an Instagram post kind of praising it um, and acknowledging that some people weren't praising it, but he said he loved it. Uh, and I thought the crux was really cool. The crux, or at least one of the cruxes high up, was this. It was a. It was like a knee bar that had been blocked. Um, and I think the, the silver medal and the bronze medal kind of fell right around that section. Sean managed to kind of like fit a knee bar in there anyway. So he kind of broke the, the, the beta a little bit um, or not broke it, like unlocked it kind of uh, managed to get the knee bar anyway and progress a couple more moves. I just thought that was a really interesting crux, um, like a, a blocked knee bar. I, I can't recall the last time that was kind of like the key crux on a route that separated the, the certainly like the top couple guys. Um, so, but, but yeah, everything you, else you said, women's semifinal and stuff. I mean, yeah, nine tops or something like that was ridiculous. Well, nine tops plus you had, you know, Aliska Adamskaya from uh, Czech Republic topped as well. She just timed out with like two seconds to go. So it was yeah. that close yep. to 10 tops. So it was, yeah, yep. it, it was undercooked and, you know, the sad thing is, yeah, there's an element of blame can go on to the root setters for that, for sure. But it's 
we're also careful to diss the root setters because it's the world's most brutal job. Sure. Um, you know, and we don't know the agenda they were given before the comp. Do you now, think they might? They the... might have missed the mark, but if they missed the mark by three climbers, because the setters, set, the organisers said, "Hey, we want five tops for the crowd." then suddenly it doesn't seem as bad because they're only a little bit out. Is that really something that, that comes up where you have event organizers, so not the IFSC necessarily, but event organizers trying to influence the, the route setting? Like, I think, not not to, to mention, not to suggest that there are conflicts here or there, but we talk about, you know, what what should be neutral and what should be, you know, subject to, to just professionals when making certain decisions. But that's a really, you know, kind of odd bit of influence that I'm, I feel like would never be productive. Like what, what input are you going to give to root setters aside from, Hey, can you use this branded volume? Like at some point in the wall, like sure. But the, like trying to suggest like a, a certain, unless it's, <laughs> could you use this, you sorry, know, spinning you 360 volume? You, you, went, on you went completely to something else I wanted to talk about, uh, about <laughs> one accidental comment, but um, no, I mean, the thing is that the event organizers, want to show sure yeah and but don't they, they like these people they, these people understand how a climbing comp works like they they should understand that when when a root setters aim for a single top on a route the amount of what, what do you call it a standard deviation like the, the standard deviation off that when that's your goal yep. is massive like so to try and tweak it easy or hard in either direction you're not guaranteeing anything and you're just sending yourself deeper into into like a result that you don't want. So that just boggles my mind that somebody that organizes a climbing World Cup would say, hey, do you mind giving us three tops instead of one? Like, that seems ridiculous. And this is the thing. I don't know if that would ever be recorded anywhere or if it's just something that happens in verbatim conversations. But, you know, the conversations I've had with root setters over the years where they've been like, ah. Oh, we don't really like setting here because this is the expectation of the organizers and this is what they like to see. And it's like, well, okay, that's, you know, that that's a layer of complexity that the guys who with the already hardest job in climbing have to, sure. you know, they can either say, look, stuff you, I've got a job to do. I'm doing it how I know how to do it. Or they can get leaned on. And I think it depends on the root setters, how that goes. If, if you were to say that to Christian Bintama, who, set uh last weekend in Villars <laughs> he'd just laugh at you you know he's so old school tough German ex-competitor mm -hmm. you know he, he, he wouldn't have any of it but some of the other setters might get pushed around a bit you don't know right um, um but you sidetracked me onto my favorite subject of the whole day <laughs> who let's put do the it. x's on the hold so you're you put the X's on the hole. I should have got a screenshot for this, but just to be clear, I think you're talking about the Expression brand uh, volumes. They had their new pipe series, which I are, I think are actually sick. So if they want to sponsor this episode where Eddie's about to shred them, <laughs> feel, <laughs> feel free to send us some money. But so the Expression logo on their holds is a big, like, uh, like a script X kind of thing. And Eddie, if you want to break down why that's a huge problem for you, go ahead. Uh, so traditionally in a World Cup, if there is a forced clipping position where you need to clip before you go into a sequence, they will put an X on the wall. Uh, sorry, an X on the on the wall next to the bolt that has to be clipped, and an X on the hole uh, on the wall next to the hole that you have to clip from. Mm -hmm. So if you see a climber climb up and there's an X, you expect them to hang on that hold, clip. And then go. And so I was watching, and there's these X's, and climbers are climbing past them, and I'm looking for the corresponding, <laughs> and I'm just like, what the hell is happening? Because yeah. to me, it looked like someone had right. got up there with chalk and marked on the yeah. X. To, and, and, you know, in the Discord, several people were like, oh, this is so confusing. Sure. And I, I actually think there is potential for confusion in the future if they have a route where they need to put X's on. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Then you got X's on every second volume. <laughs> that could really be, you know. It was um, the way it triggered me was, you know, on backfill walls at out here at least, a, a chalk, a white X means this hold is out. Whether that means it's a loose hold that could kill you if you grab it, or in an yeah. indoor context, don't use this if you want to be a badass. 
Um, which I then just like angrily run around scrubbing off with a brush because it drives me fucking crazy when people do that. So that's what the part of my brain that it triggers me. I really like the holds, but that's actually a funny, <laughs> funny point to bring up. But yeah. Yeah, John, do, do, they, do they use extras in the US? They do for much the same, the similar situation that Tyler um, said. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you do see them rarely, but occasionally you see them on walls for, for a couple different reasons. Um, it's funny because as when I was watching the competition this weekend, I was trying to remember the last World Cup where we've had a a forced clipping situation with the X. I couldn't think of one off the top of my head. It, it's been a while, which makes me think that at least I mean maybe I'm missing something, but you know it, it makes me think that probably some people watching maybe it didn't even occur to them. Um, oh, definitely, but I, yeah. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. But I if, if if you don't know, you don't know. So to be right. yeah. Mm. But yeah. I think last year in I'm gonna say uh, not last year, 2019. I'm gonna say an inside maybe. Yeah, uh, no, it was reasonably recently. Okay. That, but also the thing is, you see them sometimes on qualifying routes that you guys don't get to see when you're watching right. a live stream. Um, Which is probably but, more relevant when you've got a broader, I don't know how to describe it, like a broader range of talent among the climbers and their, their decision making might be different when it comes to <laughs> different levels of yeah, physical they, stress on the wall. But yeah, they don't, they don't know whether they're allowed to step on the bolts or not. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> if we are discussing this, you know, there have to be national team coaches that are discussing this and wanting to vocalize this to the to the organizers Man, would, I, I would think so i don't i don't i don't think it's actually a problem if there aren't any taped x's right and the, and of course it would come up in a technical briefing if if there was going to be a mandatory clipping position on a climb i i have to imagine they're trying to move away from it because it is one of those like extra levels of technical jargon that the athletes and judges and audience have to like uh, you know, worry about. So it, it's better if they don't and they just do a better job of making sure that draws are positioned well and clipping positions are, are, are safe and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, yeah, I think Eddie's hypothetical where you have a mandatory clipping position in a field of expression tubes with giant X's, you could just have people dropping off just as there be little confusion marks all over their head. Yeah. That would be a, that'd be a nightmare, nightmare situation. But anyway, I want to move yeah. on to, uh, uh, winners from, from the event. Um, I don't, I went first and then, uh, uh, let's, uh, John, let's have you, uh, let's have you run first for winners. Well, I'll tell you, I, I did not write down Sean Bailey as a winner because I was sure that one of you were going to take it as the headline. Um, so, uh, you know, two I, weeks I don't, in a row. Well, I don't have. I'll, I'll just, that's what I was going to say. I don't have that much to add about Sean Bailey's um, win this week. That I mean, just similar to to all I said last week in terms of how it just. I mean, everything I said last week. He's just one gold medal even greater than he was with everything I said there. It is interesting though, um, before I tell you my winner about Sean Bailey here, it's interesting because I think he's the first American man in history to win back to back lead gold medals. Um, Probably, yeah. I and can't think I was of it. it's like and what? I, you know, I was looking at the uh, the list of other men who have done that in the lead division over the years. And there are quite a, you know, there are quite a few, I mean, it's not quite a few, that's an overstatement. There, it's not uncommon. You know, yeah. It's not totally uncommon. Um, but you know, here are some of the names, right? Uh, Simon and Dean did it and DDA rabbit who did it. Both of them did it in 1989. Francois Legrand, you know, the great <laughs> Francois did it in like 91, 93, 94. He did it a bunch. True. Um, More than Francois two in a row Petit, probably. And, yeah. and Francois Petit did it in 93, Francois Lombard, 94. Um, there are a couple others. Yuji did it in 98. 20, 20 minutes later. Um, and Adam Andre did it in Yakub 2019. Andre Yakub, <laughs> Sachiyama did it. Doman Skovich did it. But the point is, These all sound like pretty good climbers. Can we have for shorter list the ones that didn't do it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, here's my point. that uh, uh, Most of the people on that list, I mean, that's the that's the legends of the sport, They're right? Stars, like, I yeah. mean, it, like, it's funny, like we can joke about it, like how like, yeah, there's tons of names on there, but like, that's quite an esteemed list that, that Sean Bailey, you know, is, is a part of now. 
like I said, most of those people are legends. So that's just pretty awesome for Sean to do that. Now, on to my actual winner, because like I said, I, I didn't actually write down Sean just, for the winner. Just because cash, I thought, your, cash your check from USA Climbing. Just you know, um, go go ahead, whatever. I, th- I put Ashima, keeping it in, in the United States, Team USA. I put Ashima Shirishi on the list because, it, you know, I think it's kind of, I don't know. I don't want to say we like forgot about her or like, you know, wrote her off or anything like that. But when you look at her results, right, uh, 2019, she was not at Villars to kick off the season. She got fifth at Chamonix, fifth in Briançon. So I think at the beginning of 2019, we were like, oh, this is going to be like Ashima's year, right? But then she gets 16th at Cron and she gets 25th at GMN. So she kind of like has a pretty big dip. And then she doesn't end up qualifying for the Olympics. And and she, remember, posted on social media at the time that she was, you know, there were some extraneous factors that played into her mental state or whatever for that. And then she was not at the first few lead events, the first couple lead events of this season. So it's kind of like she had these, these lower results at the end of 2019, doesn't make the Olympic team. The rest of 2020 gets messed up because of the pandemic. And then she doesn't really start this lead season. So it, that's what I mean when I kind of say maybe forgot about her is not the right expression, but it's almost like she was just like not in our in our head and not in the forefront of our mind, I think, in a lot of ways. And yet she comes out here at, at Chamonix and places, you know, seventh, makes it to the finals, seems to be maybe the the old form for Ashima, meaning like the beginning of 2019 when she was getting fifth at Chamonix, fifth at Briançon, stuff like that, kind of back to her old form. Um, so yeah, it was just a great weekend for Ashima. Put her in the winner category. I, I think the thing with uh, Ashima that I would say is it was just nice to see her back, right? Like I think yeah, she, that's she's, what I mean. She's exactly she's she's somebody where her frankly her her profile in climbing is obviously much larger than her competition specific um accolades are like most of it is obviously from from different achievements of hers and then of course the really early attention she got as a child which i'm sure is a nightmare to cope with as you become an adult um but it, it was just nice to have her back and that that theme kind of kind of continued with some other athletes and we don't have to go into it but it was also just nice to see natsuki tani back after her breakout year in 2019 and then uh dinara fakradinova who i i don't think we've seen her in a final for like five years or whatever like i remember having a crush on her in 2012 when she was in Atlanta like I forgot that Atlanta held a comp until I saw her face again like it, 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 that was just cool to see somebody who who hasn't been in a final in a very long time you're chipping did away we, at all my other winners here final? Tyler with your with naming all these other oh did, people. I, these did are, I steal all your <laughs> these are additional winners that I had on my list all spoiled <laughs> oh you guys you guys all know what what my winner is going to be so you have a chance to spoil it if you want to but anyway um, yeah. So anyway, it was nice to see these people. If you guys would like to, uh, uh, you know, elucidate those thoughts further, then you can steal it from me. It's all good. Anyway, Eddie, what what about you? What's your uh, what's your big winner? Uh, what are your thoughts on John's so answer? I, so I had two winners. Okay. Uh, first winner was USA Climbing, uh, because I think this is the best competition result for America in a lead comp ever, with a gold in men's and a silver in women's. Could be, yeah. Um, I think that's probably the best yeah. overall result they've ever had. Um, fantastic testament to the work that's been going on over the last several years in the US. Um, and, you know, a foundation that's been built up off over a long time but is now paying dividends. So I think they're a huge winner there. The other big winner for me, um, and this is... How do I word it? Because it, it sounds funny because you kind of feel like you're stating the obvious, but it's how you frame it. Okay. And so for me, the big winner is new climbers making progress because there's room for them to make progress into. Gotcha. So when you have people coming into the World Cups that aren't terribly expen- uh, experienced, the first hurdle they have to overcome is to get from qualifiers into a semi final. Next hurdle is to get from semis into a final. So you've got these steps of progression that you're you're making as you come in. And if you come into a World Cup, you know, say you had come out in 2019 as a young female competitor and you had 
Yanya, Anak, Jessica, Magdalena, Giant Kim, Akio, you know, the list goes on. You, you've got a finals list before you even... Yeah. And you took all those people out. Now, what that does is it gives the young people coming in now the opportunity to make those milestones and then mentally go, I can make that milestone. I've done it before. Even if a parameters change slightly, they've made that milestone. And, and so it ceases to be a, a mental block. It ceases to be the mental barrier that they have to overcome. So I think for, for me watching and just looking at the results and you had, you know, some climbers were just outside looking in and they really just needed maybe a little bit more luck or experience or whatever. But, you know, you had, um, looking at where am I, I'm totally looking at the wrong thing. Sorry for anyone looking at me wondering why I'm staring blindly. It's because I've got so many tabs open. But, you know, so Alexandra Tokova this year, for instance, she's just gone shunk mm -hmm. because she's had the opportunity to move into this position. You've seen people like Aliska Adamskaya come up the list. You've seen a few youngins, Sabina Van Essen into semis, things like that. And it's a mix of the older ones and the newer ones. And then the guys, you've got, um, you know, the Baudrand brothers. You've got younger Slovenians like Luca Putica. You got the young French like Paul Jamf, people like that are all in the mix. And they'll they'll be in the mix feeling relevant. And then they come to a World Cup and suddenly all the big names are there, but they're like, I've made semis before, but not climbing scared. Mm -hmm. So I think that they're the big winners because they've had this or they're in the middle, because they've got Brian Son as well. They're in the middle of having this opportunity to to overcome those um, it's almost like a rookie mode in a game, you know? Sure. Where everything's a little bit easier so that you get across it and then you play the game on full difficulty, but you've had a bit of experience already. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's super relevant. It ties into my my big winner um, right off the bat. Um, my my big winner for this is Victor Baudrand, um, or Baudrand if you want to pronounce it in uh, groomy in English or whatever. Uh, but yeah, Victor Baudrand, and like I I, I didn't double check this, but uh, the CEC suggested that he was the first Canadian uh, to make a, a lead finals uh, since Sean McCall hit the circuit, which sounds about right because I can't think of many other Canadians in history that have hit a finals. It was probably if there was, it could have easily been an American climbing as a Canadian, uh, Timmy Fairfield, if, if you ever made a finals. Um, but I like just to talk about this kid, something that's been really painful in Canada for us watching is there have been so many young climbers who are the next the next thing. They're the up and comers. Um, some of them are still on the circuit, like people like Allison Vest. Um, uh, who else? Um, uh, Elan Jonas McRae in, in Leeds specifically, there are these names who are so impressive on our national scene, who are like absolutely dominate, are incredible climbers, go to World Cups, they start doing their thing, and it just never comes together. And because we're not a country that has had much support, it becomes really difficult to convince yourself to keep doing a circuit and, and you know, pay for it yourself or whatever. And of course, other younger names like Lucas Uchida or, or Becca Frangos, who is, uh, was competing more recently. Um, we've just gone so we've gone through so many climbers who we dump all of our expectations on. And then for a lot of different reasons, they can't live up to that, that, that really high bar or they can't, you know, um, uh, uh, they can't jump over that high bar that Sean McCall and Elena Yip have, uh, Elena Yip have effectively set. So the fact that it's Victor Baudron knocks me out, first of all, because for some reason, Canadian men can only become good at lead if they stop living in Canada, which is freaking brutal. Um, so just another Canadian living in France. I think he lived in, in Utah for a long time because he would come to a lot of Canadian events here and there, uh, competed in, in U.S. stuff as well. And, and we knew he was always registered as a Canadian and that was awesome and they were talented um so it's you know it's unfortunate that he has to live somewhere else but the fact that it's him is is just wild to me and i'm i'm really proud of him now you know the, the thing that i don't want to oversell is that this could easily be one of those fluke comps like he he did a great job and he made it all the way to finals and it was incredible and i hope for more i'd really like more but like you you got to be honest in qualifiers he topped 
uh, qualifier one, which had a lot of really high finishes. And then in the second qualifier, which had a lot of tops, he didn't quite manage to, to reach a top. He got high, but didn't. So he was, you know, in the mix, but, but it didn't look like super, super impressive for qualifiers, although he did finish fourth among a pretty stacked field. In semifinals, he was part of that that group of guys that tied at a crux. And anytime you you um, you know you run into a crux situation, yourself and those competitors aren't being tested to their fullest, so it's kind of hard to gauge your performance on that specifically. And of course, he went through to finals uh, via the countbacks from qualifiers. And then in finals, I know you guys both really liked the men's qualifier, but in this particular argument, that climb was, in my opinion, not very good at letting the climbers show like their their full capabilities on on the wall. Like it really came down to a brief little prelude and then a kind of long highball boulder problem, and then that was it. And so he did well. He finished in fifth. He improved upon his his semifinal score, which is cool. Um, but I, I definitely want to make sure I'm not overselling how excited I am for him because this was kind of a weird set of circumstances in my opinion. So I hope there's more cause he's like, he's a good looking kid. He seems to be outgoing. He seems to come across as authentic, which I think is a criticism that gets leveled at Sean McCall sometimes that he's very professional and maybe you don't get a sense that you're connecting with him personally when he's, when he's on these competition stages. So I think he's kind of that full package that if he does end up putting up these results man canada couldn't couldn't have scored better uh for the kind of climber we want he's bilingual so you know that's important in canada because for some reason we require that for like everything so if he ever wants to become a governor general in canada he's got to speak both languages so he's he's got everything he needs so anyway i'm excited for victor Baudron. he's my winner it's nice to see somebody uh uh on uh, on a finals that that's not sean mccall i i'm surprised it was him but good good for him man he sees that stuff and i can't wait to watch the rest of the season with him was he when he was in utah was he being coached by palmer larson or was that just his brother being coached by palmer? yeah my understanding is uh, is him and his brother oscar uh are coached by palmer out of salt lake city um part of that kind of usa training center crew i think i i do not want to mess up which gym it was, but I'm pretty sure he was kind of associated with momentum. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd say so, yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was that set of gyms. So I don't want to assign him to a rival, a rival company, but yeah, anyway. But that's pretty cool because, you know, I've known Palmer for a long time since I was going to say Youth Worlds 2015, where he came along and he'd just aged out of youth himself, but he came along to support his friends. And, Right. He's one of those coaches that has a real heart for his athletes. So it's always good when you have someone like that and you you see the athletes do well and you're like, yeah. It it, you know. it, it does seem like the kind of relationship where uh where the you know, those climbers are just as invested in him as as he is uh in them. It seems like a great relationship they have. Um so yeah, yeah it's uh, he's somebody I'm sure we'll we'll have to talk to eventually as well. But yeah. So that's my winner. Any uh, any of you guys want to shoot down my Canadian nominee, or am I good? Can I? No, you're this? good. I was excited oh. for you. I wanted to give you that winner. <laughs> you know, I, I knew that you were gonna do it, and I was happy for you. It's um, been such a bare year, man. Like we're supposed yeah. to have two Olympians, and I haven't seen a freaking Canadian climb since 2019 or whatever. It's garbage. Yeah. Like, yeah, it was awesome. What I the was shit so psyched for you. I hope, you know, I hope, uh, I hope Victor, all the best of luck. I hope he makes a lot, you know, many, many more finals because it was too. fun having him in there. Yeah. Yeah, I I was really impressed by his climbing so and and, you know unlike you tyler i actually i like those short spiky brutal finals because you've got to switch on and i thought he switched on really well um that that was the final where if you're an inexperienced climber i'd expect you to fall off very early because you just wouldn't anticipate the difficulty to ramp like that sure um, he, that's fair. he almost Which, did, didn't he? Am I thinking of the final? Right, where <laughs> like the very, the very oh, yeah, first yeah, yeah, yeah. move, yeah, bro. Um, but then, but then he, boom. yeah, yeah. Props yeah. for him just for catching sweating the sweating instantly. I was like, oh, this is like exactly how you would invalidate everything good you did in qualifiers and semis. It's just like, oh, I forgot the the jib was on the other side of the volume. I guess I'll go home now with up up one plus. <laughs> yeah, he just wanted to get your heart rate going, all, all of yeah, his Canadian viewers. Um, yeah. yeah, no, props for him for catching that fall because he, I mean, that's, you know, that's really hard to do. He like fell and, and managed to stay on the wall. So, Thank God. Um, yeah. Thank God. All right. Let's, let's talk about losers. And I'm, uh, I think, uh, who, who do we have set up to? Uh, so I went and then John went. Now it's Eddie's turn. Eddie's first up. King of the losers. Go, go, Yay. go. For him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, 
Okay, all guns blazing. Here we uh, go. Um, there, there, needs, there needs to be consistency. I'm sorry, but it just needs to be consistency. Um, the fact that they had some, and here I'm going to talk about bolts, but I'm also going to talk about judging in general. But let me lead with the bolts. They had some bolts covered. They had some bolts uncovered. And it made no sense. And then you had some climbers marked down for standing on bolts. You had other climbers not marked down for standing on bolts. Right? So it made no sense. And, and there just seemed to be this inconsistency across the board. And, you know, at the beginning when you said, oh, you don't want a conspiracy theory. And the problem is, no, we don't want a conspiracy theory. But if you keep adding evidence <laughs> by you know, things that people see and go, well, sh actually, and then the next one happens like, well, actually, and the next one happens, you're like, I'm starting to get a, a, a little bit of a trend going here. And, you know, if I was, I, I know she's the happiest person in the world, but if I was Natalia Grossman or if I was Natalia Grossman's coach, I would be spitting tax mm -hmm. because this is professional sport and in my mind, she was robbed of 1,400 euros and a gold medal. So we're specifically uh, talking, just to just to outline it, uh, uh, Laura Rigora, what I think, at least myself and Eddie, John, I think you also saw a clip. I'm not sure how you feel about it. We'll talk about it. I'll just throw, uh, throw it up on the screen. Uh, but Laura Rigora, we personally believe, stepped on uh, the bolt. Watch her, her left foot watch right her there. Left foot. Now watch her heel. So uh, it's a bit too late now because she's already made the move, but... If you watch her left foot and you watch her heel and you'll see that her heel comes from there to there and then you'll see she grabs the hold and then she looks back like what was I standing on and then she looks forward again. To me, if they mark Adam Andra down for standing in a bolt in Hachioji because there was flexion in his leg, that flexion in um, Laura's, Laura's ankle was just as much as there was flexion in Andra's leg in Hachi and Hachioji. Can, At the world championships again, qualifying for the more? Olympics. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it it, it yeah, does look like her heel to, to point out what Eddie's saying. I'll do the very it slow looks like version. Her, yeah. her heel moves up as if she steps on right yeah. there. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it, she gets a little purchase on it. Um, and and the look back would indicate that she maybe felt something. I you know that 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 particular angle. Um, and this was the stream angle, by the way, which I'm pretty exactly. sure cannot be used by the judges to make the determination. Those judging determinations, I'm pretty sure, are only used by the official judging cameras, which, from what I understand, are separate. Um, and I'm pretty sure you can't use like a, a coach's uh, camera either. So like most coaches are videotaping attempts, but I'm pretty sure the judges aren't allowed to use. Yeah, there's only official cameras that can yeah. be used, which are yeah. uh, fixed mounting right. cameras. But so to me, why wasn't there a bolt cover on that bolt? Why wasn't there one of the big round bolt covers? Because then, then it's no longer an issue. Yeah. Because was Laura going to do the do the route if she didn't stand on it? Yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. But she stood on it. So if you're going to be consistent within the rules, that's where she finishes. So she ends up being third. And the reason she ends up being third is the next one that you're going to show me, Tyler. So right here in the left foot. So Vita Lucan tied for third and was knocked down to fourth by count back to qualifiers. Um, and so yep. if, if this had been consistently judged along with the Laura bolt, uh, Vita would drop down a few steps and uh, third would yeah. have gone to Laura instead of Alexandra Tokova. Who would have gone to silver and then Natalia would have gone to gold. Yeah. So, so could you now, play that again, Tyler, real yeah, fast? Play, yeah. play Laura's and then play Vita's just so we can see kind of the comparison. Um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll play uh, Laura's super slow again. So you're watching the foot on the right side of the screen. Was was not deemed... Neither on. of neither of these were judged. Neither as... of them were judged as. Yeah, but I, to I, be honest, I, I, in the Vita case, we don't even know if it was protested. Exactly. We know there was an appeal put in on Lara. Yeah, we don't know if there's an appeal put in on Vita. Yeah, because Vita was knocked out of the podium. Although it would affect prize money, it, it wouldn't affect the medal spot. So, so. But anyway, here's the Vita one again, and you're watching the left side of the screen. 
her left foot stepping on the top of that long draw right there. Foot locks in. And then she lets go of it there. Yeah. So, and in my, it's, it, this is, this is the kind of thing where I think when we talk about it, because it's so, we're so hesitant to, to make hay of this kind of stuff. I think really all we're trying to do is we're just trying to point out, Hey, these things happened. They very convincingly look like they happened. Now the issue is the interpretation, right? We're not trying to roast the athletes. Like this is what sucks no, about uncovered not. bolts. That's like, garbage that we have bolt yeah. covers, which like totally change the game and eliminate this like ridiculous source of like technical garbage. Yeah, um, and take and, and to take nothing but, away from just to so you to your point so we're clear yeah to take nothing away from laura like she won fair and square the appeal was turned down like she deserves to to take home the gold uh you know yeah. and, <laughs> so and, and so that's where the issue is 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 just the like the inconsistency of these judgments because that it it's the and this is where the where we talk about the conspiracy theory thing it is frustrating that it had to when be an italian technical director who judged in favor of Marcello Bombardi versus Yannick Flowey over frankly like a pretty inconsequential difference in what a plus is and I, I honestly think there were some other athletes in that plus area uh, that that were also weak uh, or in comparison so the fact that an Italian judgment won in that case for an Italian athlete and then again here a judgment made against an Italian athlete, which I think had a very strong case to be upheld, was not. Um, that is frustrating material for people that want to build a case that there might be some inconsistency um, in these kind of jury uh, jury decisions. And the thing is here, we are not just talking from the outside looking in. Previously, I obviously worked closer to the competitors. So I was at these events and I would see these things. And as a result of that, the competitors still, a lot of them I talk to on a very regular basis through FaceTime or messaging or whatever. Uh, and I want you to pull up. I didn't keep the screenshot, but I have it on uh, my phone. So you can, if you want to read it or something, I can verify that it's what you're saying it is. I just didn't want to implicate them based okay. on how they write or anything like that. No, no, fair, fair. Let me pull it up. Uh, so this was from an athlete um, very recently. Uh, Olympians are protected like diamonds. No appeals against them are accepted. Hmm. Which is interesting because I, I, I don't really know what to say beyond that, aside from it's frustrating that other athletes have that sentiment in their head like that's not a good sign you know we talked about it when we were dealing with the uh with the lara uh weight issue in one of our previous episodes where we it would be nice if the athletes showed some sense of solidarity around the process for uh, uh identifying and addressing possible eating disorders but this greater issue uh is you know do the is there kind of consensus or not consensus isn't the right word. Do the athletes really believe in the structures and mechanisms that are being used to protect them and to judge them and uh, which like the whole circuit runs on. And this is another one, a piece of evidence that there, there are some people that feel like that's not the case. Yeah. I mean, that athlete went on to say that she believed that competitions were, were two tiered. Now you were an Olympian or a non-Olympian. You weren't, you weren't treated the same at all. And did, did this no, athlete so make any comment about whether that was just in, in terms of uh, like ruled, like technical judgments, or was that in terms of how they're treated? I, I don't really know what I'm, what I'm trying to suggest, but are there other ways that they're being shown any preference? Uh, look, the, this athlete and others have gone into many things. Let's, I, I, I'm not sure. going to be the okay. hearsay king, but all I'm going to do is say, you, you know, as you know, I spent a long time working in a maximum security prison and we got, I won't say beaten into us because that would <laughs> set the wrong mental picture, but we got massively enforced on us within our role that we had to be firm, fair and consistent. Mm -hmm. If you were firm, fair and consistent, everything else would follow. And we haven't seen fair and we haven't seen consistent. Yeah. And that makes this question question so whether the ifsc needs something like an appeals page where they literally if an appeal is made they the appeal reason gets put on a website and the appeal result gets put on a website 
so that it's measurable. Mm-hmm. So that in future, other teams go, should we appeal this? Well, no, look at what that appeal was. That appeal was for the same thing. It didn't go through. So then you have precedent set. So similar to in law where you have a history of cases and you can yeah. look at what's happened. You know, maybe we need this in climbing as well to, um, yeah, to, to ensure precedent, to ensure consistency. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, you know, we when we have spoken in the past about how we would like for a TDs to have to announce a judgment call in the same way that a referee does in some sports where they directly address the crowd, it's it, 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 as a solution, we kind of suggest that as a way of acknowledging the fact that it is possible that referees or judges have a certain amount of partialness to possibly certain athletes. And sometimes decisions are made that, fan bases disagree with which obviously in football recently we've seen that same kind of thing where where and maybe it even involves uh <laughs> the italian team actually um but the, the idea being that you know if you if you can't have extremely consistent judgments made across all of the different tds and all of the different juries which would be very hard to do at the very least you can make it fully transparent and make sure that the audience and the community is able to voice so not only see what these judgments are and understand them, but also to voice their approval or disapproval uh, back at it so that it's at least not hidden. And I think that's the frustrating part is that there isn't, you know, in this kind of profession, in this kind of job of being a, a judge or a referee, it's there. It, it is very hard to ensure that they're going to be impartial. And so you need some kind of check against that. And, and my preferred way personally would be for it to be out in the open. Yeah, I, absolutely. Uh, John, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I, I was just, you know, I was thinking, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I have a lot to add. I, I, I agree 100%, Tyler. And I think part of the reason why I don't have a lot to add is because I know we've talked about this before, um, because we've had issues before with bolts, stepping on bolts, as everybody knows, and, and kind of um, we've discussed that. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, not a lot to add. I agree. Yeah. The, the only thing I will add, which is a slightly subjective question, is I'm wondering if there will be bulk covers at Olympics, being that they weren't on the uh, approved holds list. Do they count as holds? Yeah, I'm really concerned about that, too. After we saw them debut in Innsbruck, where they were incredible and maybe one of the most positive aspects of the entire competition. You know, it's funny how quickly our judgment changes on how necessary something is. But of course, when these things would come up in the past, Hachioji, like the example you brought up, it was our complaint was like, why don't we have something to fix this? Like, why isn't this dealt with already? This isn't difficult. Like, just, you know, put something on top of it. Or, or in some cases, when possible, remove the bolt. Although I think for a lot of walls that's far more difficult just because it's, I think, attached to one of the structural bolts. Uh, so just removing them whenever is kind of tough. Um, but yeah, now, I, that, I, we've, I actually, now that we've had two World I, Cups so, without them, I, I am totally up in the air. I don't know if they're going to be back. I, I was actually thinking, Tyler, when I was watching this, you know, the Olympics is like it's this whole other <laughs> uh, like beast of production tools and and technology and, and money, let's be honest, yeah. right? Like, I, I think bolt covers almost seems archaic for what is possible at the Olympics. Like, why not? Well, that's the one part put... I worry about is because, like, the IOC is going to be great at the broadcast stuff as far as, you know, like all the stuff that they know how to do, they know how to do it. But they don't know a damn thing about root setting, right? Like, they don't – They're. I'm certain that they still don't understand all of the implications of, of root setting and climbing. I don't think they understood – the the level of of you know um uh what am i trying to say like the potentials for conflict between root setters from one country and athletes like i don't think they realized how much of a mess that is in bouldering and lead like yeah you you guys try and set uh, like you know um uh, fair playing fields guess what that literally doesn't exist in climbing so i i'm not convinced that the the uh resources of the olympics would fix this necessarily i think it comes down to the ifsc yeah, I mean, I suppose that would be maybe the realistic way to look at it. I, I remember when we were talking about this in when Andra stepped on the bolt, you know, a couple years ago, we were saying, like, it's 2020, you know, in this day and age, it's not outlandish to think that you could have some sort of technology put in this bolt that says whether or not pressure was put on it, right? Like, that—that that is not— sure. 
that is not like space age technology in the year 2021. Mm -hmm. Like that's pretty basic. All of our smartphones have touch, touch screen technology and whatever. Um, now maybe to implement that at the world cup level is a little unrealistic, but my point was like you, you think of something like that in the Olympics, like that seems like a, like a technology that they would probably already have or already have access to easy access to, because you look at other sports like tennis and stuff that sense when a ball is in or out, you know, beyond a line and, and are able to zoom in really closely on it and stuff like that. The world cup circuit is not going to get that technology anytime soon, but the Olympics, like, you know, maybe, and I think we can all agree that that technology does not sound that wacko to have like bolt, you know, sensors. On yeah. But like, why even it. bother when you could just screw a plastic teacup over the bolt? Like that's the beauty of this, right? Is like, we have the, this, this like super cheap solution and it's not, and it's prop. It's like, it's not patented. I'm assuming because you just make it a different shape and like, nobody cares. Like it's, I, oh, well, it's also climbing hold. So, you know, fuck it. Just copy the thing directly and sell it under a different brand. Well, like, I can't... Exactly. I mean, yeah. get forced climbing to make them. Campbell Harrison yeah. said on, on uh, the commentary <laughs> for this World Cup that part of the issue with the bolt covers was they had to figure out a way that they were made so climbers can't crimp them. Because I guess if you make it, if you just say, okay, you're allowed to step on the bolt cover, you know, then that maybe theoretically means you're allowed to use it. It's a it's usable surface, right? Um, it's, so there are like some kind of technical things that would have to be figured out. I, I could um, I could see that maybe becoming a problem, like the ones where it's covering the top of the bolt but not the bottom because it's got like a draw off it. Yeah, possibly. But I mean, I I, I I'm kind of I'm kind of mixed because the climbers are obviously far more conscious about where their hands are than they are of where their feet are. And we make rules about the difference between a foot and a hand all the time. So like in particular, talking about T-nuts uh, on a wall, right? So if if we can do that, I feel like we can make the same judgment for this. Um, but yeah, that's but that's that is a fair point that they are technically in, in the considered a usable hold for now, I guess. Like the rules, I don't think have uh, they're at least they're not mentioned explicitly in the rules as something that you can't grab, I don't think. But um, may, maybe they've sent out an addendum or something to the to the juries or whatever. I, I have no idea. It wouldn't be wouldn't be crazy. But yeah, anyway, um, I'm going to I'm going to go next, I guess. Um what should it be? I, I think it's going to be uh, the stream quality. I think that's the the loser for this one. I didn't bring it up last week because Villars, they had the power outage and that part, like, that sucks. If you had a bigger budget, you could afford generators or whatever it is. And I, I don't know exactly what the nature of the power problem was last week. Although there was more than just one cutout, to be clear, in Villars. Like, there were multiple smaller stutters that were annoying. Um, but happening again in Chamonix at one of the biggest events and stepping on and completely obliterating the return of Dinara, as I re mentioned earlier, you have to wait a couple of days to actually see her climb. That really sucked. Um, but straight up the, the view, like the amount of people that we watch these world cup with, uh, world cups with just in the discord, the amount of people that are just like, nah, I gotta go. Like, I'm not going to bother waiting for this to find out when it is. Cause some of the stutters are a couple seconds and some of them are a couple minutes. And frankly, my attention is lost at that point. Um, so you got to figure it out. Like Switzerland and France are our first world countries, my friends. I know they're in the mountains, but like those are luxurious places to hang out and internet connections and power connections shouldn't be your problem with the broadcast. Um, so that was really disappointing uh, because I thought we had hit a better level of consistency, frankly, and I really hope it doesn't continue in uh, Briançon. Yeah, I, I would completely agree with that. I, as I think I said either earlier in the podcast or before the podcast, I only watched semifinals last night um, because when I woke up and I went on to the Discord and people were saying it's dropping and this, that, I went, okay, and I just waited for the re-up so that I could watch the whole thing uninterrupted because I knew I'd go crazy. Yeah. You know, looking at the screen, looking at it, it's, come on, really? Like, yeah. And, and I'm curious because in Valar, at least, didn't the Olympic Channel stream keep running? Yeah, which was curious. Yes. So, so do they have different power to the IOC than the IFSC? Well, that's the part. They, I, might, they I, might be on a different grid. Because my, what I, it seemed, and I might be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure the Olympic Channel and the IFSC stream had the same camera angles. So 
what that proves is the cameras are running on one set of power and then somewhere down the line between the cameras and where it splits off to the Olympics and the IFSC, there was a, a change in the power. And I don't know, I don't know whose fault that is or whatever, but um, yeah, so it was, it was uh, just them. Like the Olympic stream was still good, but it kind of sucks giving your viewership to the Olympics. Like don't oh, give it to the Olympics.com, man. Yeah, I, I agree with that. But no, I was just saying I was perplexed how it can be a power outage that only affects certain things. But, you know, maybe it was as simple as a cable got unplugged. Yeah, totally. I, I, I genuinely realized don't that know. was running to the production van. Yeah, if it if it ended up going through one of the production things to take a few minutes to reboot, like, yeah, that sucks. So, yeah, I, I can yeah. imagine. I agree. But, um, I, it's. Oh, sorry, Eddie, please continue. No, no, please go, go, go. I was just going to say it's, you know, the the unfortunate thing, if it was just one event, I don't think any of us would have brought it up because, it you know, it's okay. It's just yeah. it just happened one event, whatever. But the fact that it's happened now, it for, on the, off the top of my head, I can think of the two two European, uh, th- this weekend in Chamonix and, and Villar, I think. Yep. And then it also, there were issues at a Speed World Cup, um, or maybe that oh, was one of the same... But it we was missed... this. It was the Velar speed. I'm pretty sure had issues, okay. but it, it's it's. Yeah. But, but also, you had Salt Lake City, where the speed had no commentary for the first two <laughs> thirds of the comp. <laughs> right. Yeah. And you then know, in there, Innsbruck, there is... they only had one mic for semifinals as well for commentary. Yeah. <laughs> there is yeah. continuous little things. Mm-hmm. And and the unfortunate takeaway is this is i think it's safe to assume that this is the time when there are more eyes on the sport than ever because people are reading about this in you know time magazine and the new york times they're reading about climbing going going to be in the olympics so they're like oh i'll check it out i'll watch the world cup circuit or whatever uh, these these past few events have had more eyes on them probably than any events ever any climbing world cups in, in you know before them and those new viewers, those people that are like, yeah, I'll just kind of check this out, right? They're not gonna, they're not gonna have the patience to sit around totally. and and wait. Uh, so you're really, you're you're chipping away at that potential growth in viewership. Those new viewers, having those people sticking around longer, you're you're chipping away at that because they're not gonna put up with with a, a stream that's dropped for you know, 15 minutes or whatever. Can you imagine they'll, if they'll you had just, paid for these streams too? Like if I had paid for a season pass to watch this and that's what you get, like, can you imagine that? that now I, I emerge, imagine they make the argument, well, if you were paying for it, we'd have better gear or whatever, which is fair. But like, you know, you know, if I'm, if you're going to get me to pay for something, you got to convince me it's going to be a good product first. Like it's not the other way around, frankly. So did, yeah. did either of you gentlemen watch the British bouldering champs? I watched a bit of semi finals or was it no it's a bit of finals i usually just watch to see their scoreboard that's pretty much it but i don't really pay attention uh, okay. to the climbers tech native does a great job with the scoreboard man well, at the least they have in the past it wasn't, te- it, it wasn't tech native this time it was another crew because the tech native guy actually came on and chad and said it's not us this year because it, it looked different crew, this time it still looked okay but it wasn't as good yeah but the tech native guys are amazing mm-hmm. but these other guys were good as well and if you go back and watch semis it was actually fantastic because they had working split screens right and they had so they separated men's and women's semis rather than men's and women's finals so men's and women's finals were together with okay. split screens men's and women's semis were separate so you had men's final men's semis and women's semis four climbers four split screens good resolution good camera angles you could watch all the climbing i was just sitting there going i've just seen everyone climb in semis and sure it's too it difficult it's too it. difficult you can't ask yeah. so much of this international you know, sporting body but yeah i mean like <laughs> running semis separately that's that is a scheduling nightmare for i I don't know that's that seems like a lot just considering the the issues with qualifiers already like that does seem like a brutal thing to fit into your schedule in my opinion like I well don't but know. then they ran then they ran finals together so it ends up being the same length comp Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm half and half because I still, I still personally, I, first of all, just personal preference. I like having the finals separated just in case cool stuff does happen. But I also feel like it's more like more, uh, what am I trying to say? Like more sellable media that the IFSC can sell to the broadcasters. Like they're not going to, 
these broadcasters aren't going to buy twice the semifinals. Like that's not what people want to watch. Right. But they will buy twice the finals kind of, finals. I don't yes, know. that's kind exactly. of one argument, but yeah. Um, okay. Eddie went and then I went and uh, John who's <laughs> who crapped so, the bed this week. We are moving way down my list of win- <laughs> winners here. We've been talking about very high level stuff. So it, it this seems very odd for me to like, like a uh, funnel way down now. Um, and, and I hope it doesn't seem harsh, but so, you know, on my list, you know, I had the, the too many tops in the women's semi, I had the stream, I had the bolt. So we're going into my fourth string here <laughs> right. of uh, the losers category. Yeah. Um, and it, I, I feel bad in light of how we've talked about all these kind of really large things. I feel, I feel bad mentioning this one, this one individual, especially because I like him. He's one of my favorite on the circuit. Um, but I, you know, I, I wrote down Domans Kovic, um, and and again, I, I, he's one of my favorites. I, I like him a lot. I always enjoy watching with him. I've corresponded with him. Always a really wonderful, um, cordial guy to correspond with. Um, I think the reason I put him on this this list in this category was two reasons. First of all, during the pandemic, one of the things I did in in kind of the downtime is, is I went back and watched a lot of the old World Cups and. As you both know, 2016, 2017, Doman is like, he's like one of the kings, right? I mean, he's getting like, you know, second place, fourth place, third place, second, like he's he's rocking and rolling in those years. Uh, and then also when I was compiling that list of people that have won back-to-back World Cups, lead World Cups, like we said, legendary list of people. And Doman is one of the people that is on that list. So we know that on a given day, he can be number one, right? Literally. I mean, he can be yeah. the best of the best. And yet, if you look at his 2021, I think having that in mind, I go, I've go. i gone into this season kind of expecting him at any, any day now, any comp now, right, to have kind of go back to his old ways. 2021, so far, he was 17th in Innsbruck, 15th in Villars, and 25th here in Chamonix. So it just feels like something maybe, and and you know, 17th and 15th are respectable, perfectly good results. I don't want to act like those are, you know, way down the list or anything. But, but considering that we expect him to be maybe podium, right? Um, it, it just kind of feels like maybe something's not clicking yet. Uh, I, I I don't know what it is. I want it to click because I like him a lot. Um, but do I you, just but do you get the vibe that he's like taking this? Ser- like this season seriously though because it does seem like the the gym that he's building is like probably his main focus i, I don't that's just the read i get if he's i imagine yeah. he's involved maybe he's charming it and has like nothing to do with it but like you I know, know. I, I don't know but one of the things i was thinking is we have talked so much about how slovenia has so much depth on their team right and obviously yanya is the the face of that in the women's division but i think like Doman should be because in for the men's division or he could be because he's such a veteran 20 I don't know what is he 27 or something like that um he's got these like great accolades to his name but he's just not it just doesn't feel like he's kind of the figurehead of the men's division and I think part of that is because he's he kind of has had just some a rough start to this season not the greatest results in in kind of the more recent seasons I don't know I want him to get back to his old ways I really do yeah, I, I just get the vibe that COVID started and he was like, I'm going to build a gym. That's what I'm going to do. And yeah, kind of, but kind of just going off your your point, and this was kind of counter to Eddie's point where he, one of his big winners was, uh, or or a positive was having this these openings for these younger athletes to come through and start, you know, moving their way up the, the ranks while, while a lot of the big kids have gone to do the Olympics. I feel like some of those kids that should be moving up the ranks, namely Alberto Hines Lopez and Sasha Lehman, who well, one of them is going to the Olympics, but he's still at these events. He, those are the kind of guys that should be winning these events in this case, right? Like when everybody else is gone, like Alberto had a banger 2019. So did Sasha Lehman with his first World Cup win. Like now is the time, guys. And they haven't had the kind of seasons that you would expect if you said, okay, I'm taking all these names off the list. Here are the stars, right? And Doman dropped out like super low, and Alex dropped out super low, right? Like that's that's kind of my flip side. Is I'm like, well, who's supposed to win now? And and the guys in particular, they're not quite uh, not quite winning it. But yeah, it's same kind of thing. Is like you know, with the door open, it's not just the new kids that have the possibility to move up. It's the guys that are falling off a little bit, or it's the guys who who should be the royalty in the next generation. So yeah, no, I totally agree. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, and I think we're seeing some of the established royalty who aren't in the Olympics making a good bash of it. You're always seeing Stefano up there, for instance. Yeah. He's, you know, he's showing that he's one to be reckoned with. And, and it'd be easy for some of these guys that work so hard for the Olympics to be a little bit disenchanted this year and a little bit over it. Uh, in Domin's case, I do think... I do think probably the gym plays an as plays a part in it that he's, you know, he was taking, was it 2020 he was going to take off anyway? He had announced that he was having a sabbatical from climbing. Um, that makes sense. That, oh, that's right. I, f I forgot about that. He did, I that, think. Yeah. Yeah. And that, but that then coincided with COVID, but I think in his mind, he finished his sabbatical, but his mind hasn't quite finished his sabbatical yet, maybe. Um, but you know he's phenomenally talented. He can be up there. It's just a case of getting the focus, getting the application, yeah. and yeah. yeah um, I, I forgot one little little loser oh, and yeah. one little winner if we have time. Yeah, for sure. Uh, my little loser is the Japanese team. When was the last time they only had one finalist? <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> yeah, good yeah. point. Like you know that that was a bit of a. A turn up. They obviously with travel restrictions and other restrictions, they didn't bring many people over. But it, that's a rough one for them. They only had, was it three guys and three women competing? But only one finalist is a is a tough run for them. Yeah, um, it's funny because we young... we said that about Villars having none of them like podium, but then it just got worse this week. Frankly, like barely yeah. making finals. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to add my little winner. I, I know I'm all out of context here, but my little winner is just one that we missed, which is I'm really loving the miking of the walls this year. Yes. I think it gives us a much better... It's the best thing that the production crew are doing because it's giving us uh, an oral soundtrack which meets what we're seeing. And when I used to take photos on the mats, if you're taking photos of Adam Andre, you can tell where he is by the sound, let alone looking at him. Um, you know, I've been at the top of a route and it sounds like a train coming towards you. He breathes so consciously and intensely and a lot of the climbers are really noisy, but you don't see that in the old fashioned streams, but now they've mic'd them and you're hearing all this interplay from the climbers. You're hearing all the squeaks and growls and grunts. And it's, it's interesting because it's always happened, but this is the first year that 99% of the people would know it happens. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really, I big, you know, big clap on the back for the guys to get those things mic'd up because I think that's a huge, that improves the quality of the content when you, you just know how hard they're working. A hundred percent. Yeah. I feel like we talked about that a lot last season as well as that was something we really wanted because there were those moments where, where you're just like, oh, I can't hear a damn thing. Like it, it felt uh, like we lost an entire dimension. It felt like a 3D movie suddenly just getting wiped out into into two dimensions. And and now having it back is incredible. And you get to learn more about the athletes. Just you know, when you I don't know, you see a picture of somebody and you make a lot of assumptions immediately about their personality, how they sound, how their mannerisms, and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, getting to know how somebody sounds when they're just screaming all of their effort like out of them really does make you feel differently about how different athletes are. And I think it's been great. Like some of the, some of the athletes really surprise you with how they sound, frankly, and it's been cool. So yeah, no, that, that is a, a really good, uh, also on an episode we were laid kind of heavy into production, probably just a little gold star thumbs up on the mics. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, you know, that was, as I said, that's my big takeaway from the biggest improvement this year from the production quality is having, having those mics really adds to the, to the event. Yeah, I'll, I'll actually tack another one on just to make it sound like we're friendly people is the the vertical progression scoreboard for lead is great. I don't I still don't understand why you can't have the names of all of the athletes visible. For some reason, it's the person climbing and the person who's ranked directly above them, but nobody else. Like, why not just show the names of everybody there? They're not in the way of each other. It's easy. Just do it. So that would be nice because then you don't even have to show the scoreboard at all. Like the, the graphic has literally all the information. It's got their name and it's got the score. You can add a flag yeah, if you it, want to. I don't give a shit. Like it's, it's, it, that's, you know, it's we like a live scoreboard. Exactly. That's what we talk about all the time. It's just like put the scores on the screen all the time. And it's so close. It's right there. You can see the number of this, like somebody put a scoreboard up and then just remove the names. It's like having a scoreboard on the football. It's like, it's two to one to who I don't know. It's one of yeah. the teams is winning. Yeah. So if they yeah, could, yeah. if they could fix that lead would 
the lead scoring would be pretty much perfect. So yeah, yeah, close. I don't know. It feels like it's a uh, like we're wrapping it up. That feels like a, a good place to to end it on. Um, at at this point, this deep into everything, uh, I always um, you know always uh uh plug some stuff so of course there's a patreon if you want to support the discord like subscribe all that kind of stuff but also if you make it this far into the episode you're the kind of person that we want in the plastic weekly discord where we watch comps together and talk about all the nerdy stuff behind climbing it's me and it's john and it's people like eddie and a lot of other people um that make it a really they add a lot frankly to to the viewing experience for comps that we had uh one guy made a bingo card for for different funny things that might happen in finals and i think we scored a double bingo actually it was awesome uh when when a slovenian had a low fall that locked it for us uh luca potasar uh got the bingo for us we had people from behind the scenes showing us pictures of how the athletes were looking some of the some of the discord members were in chamonix um so it's it's really cool and if you're watching this far into the episode you clearly care about the weird stuff of climbing that we do so come hang out the link is in the description other than that i really appreciate you watching and of course to john and eddie uh it's always great to have you both eddie i know we're going to have you back very soon um but i really appreciate you hopping in at this last minute while we try and fit the schedule before Brienne's on and uh and we will uh, john's john's raised the finger yeah <laughs> what's up the official I, just finger. Wanted, I realized that at the very very beginning we talked about um just like as an aside we mentioned the photograph behind me right and uh i realized i didn't give credit to the photographer and eddie is a photographer so this is important to me i want to make sure that's from brie robles uh she is the official usa climbing photographer um and so everybody should find her on instagram and and follow her work i wanted to make sure i i got that plug in for for the person who we talked about the photo but we didn't actually talk about the person who, who took it and uh so i want to give credit to her Absolutely. That's that's the, one of the other entire themes of the Discord is Eddie and uh, sits are wrecking people for using their photos all the time. So if you if you want to just hear yeah, two yeah. guys ramble about people that have stolen their photos, get hey, in the Discord wait, down stolen? below. What are you talking about? No, I, you. I, I, I'm not uh, selling it. Uh, no, yeah, not, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not not that. I'm just saying. It's a, I it's a, the, the one I love. The one I yeah. loved recently was, did you see the whole article that was stolen? Yeah, well, see? we're, we're going to have that, that writer on uh, on the show for next week, hopefully. So uh, we might bring that Hold up. The, the, the copier or the writer? The, the actual writer, the pre-translation <laughs> writer. Yeah, who frankly has the capability to translate it themselves if they wanted to, but I doubt they will. Oh, absolutely. So, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we'll talk more about that next week, uh, probably Tuesday on the debrief after Brienne's on. So make sure you're watching Brienne's on this weekend, I guess a day or two after this comes out. It's the last of the four Alpine World Cups before the Olympics. And then we take a nice long break before uh, the remaining World Cups and World Championships. Eddie's raised the finger, hit the brakes. What's up, Eddie? I have. Don't forget the next competition. When is the next competition, guys? What are you t talking about? Paraclimbing World Cup happening tomorrow? Paraclimbing World Cup is tomorrow, which by the time this comes out could be today. I don't know. It how will long be it's today for sure. <laughs> it will be today. But yeah, there's been no promotion from other parties about it, but the paraclimbing is always fantastic, is well worth watching. Uh, some of the most inspiring climbing you'll ever see. So please take the time to tune into paraclimbing finals and watch watch that. 100%. We know you're thirsty for for more climbing. Yeah, Brian Son uh, did the double last year as well, 2020. Am I remembering that right? Did they they do... did the they did the world champs. Yeah, yeah the, that was a uh, yeah two two events in the entire year, and they were both in the same spot. Uh, anyway, let's wrap this up for real. No more fingers, guys. Thank you very much for watching. Make sure you like this, leave a comment, subscribe, and we will see you very soon in the next one.